Well, we're rolling. So, guys, today we got Rick and Cole Prospero. I've raced with these guys for a, a long time now. Well, not raced with, watched them win a bunch of classes <laughs> yeah. as I was kind of in the same class trying to go fast type of stuff. But they have the Green Mambo, which is a green FC RX-7. Yes. Yep. FC RX-7. You've been racing it for a long time. Mm -hmm. You and your son, it's a big block. Twin, well, now it's a no-time car, so I probably can't tell what it is but it's like, yeah it's a it's a big block twin turbo car yeah it's been the same combination since probably the inception yeah 2015 august 2015 was yeah. when we first brought the car out so started building it in 13 and it started out with a stock block big block yep right with twin board warner 75s yeah so yeah that was kind of the idea was to run that engine and do like drag week because you made drag week 2015 with it yeah and Basically went from there with that that stock block, cracked a few cylinders in it, and you went with the the engine that you pulled out of your wagon, the, which is currently what's in it now. Yeah. And then went with the bigger turbos and everything. So, so it was a stock block, big block at the time. Correct. Yeah. Yep. In my when it was in my uh, '65 wagon, we got that thing to run. It went what like 801. It went 801 at 178 at yep. 4200 pounds. Yeah. Back in like 2010. Yep. Oh wow. So, 80. <laughs> that much weight in yep. 2010 with those turbos that's pretty because when you talk about times i feel like people don't talk about years <laughs> yeah, very right. much and you kind of have to preface stuff with years sure. because like yeah okay 780s isn't that impressive now even though it should be it's you know. <laughs> <laughs> but when you say 2010 it kind of adds like a little level of like more wowing so stock block big block what is that just like, are they all pretty similar or is there like a specific one you guys want to uh, get? Just, like a, just a Gen 4. It's a, come out of a, it came out of actually a Suburban I, I had at the shop. Uh, we pulled the motor and uh, it was a four bolt main block factory. And uh, the architecture of those big engines, are, they're incredible. They handle an amazing amount of power. And we basically uh, left water through it. If you filled those things, they'd handle probably 2,000 horsepower stock. But of course, you got to use good internals. Yeah. Do you do a crank in that thing? Yeah, we actually just did a Eagle forty three forty forged assembly, like simple, okay. simple uh, rotator from Eagle, and we bought some off the shelf AFR heads and just kind of ran it that way. It was very, very basic. I started running uh, fuel injection. Uh, we ran the Axel DFI was our first uh, go around with fuel injection. So Axel DFI. I yeah. don't even know what That's that. That's old school <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Never even looked at like yeah so anything. I uh, it's uh, basically. Uh, the, I guess John Meany from Big Stuff, he he invented the XL. He did the fast, and uh, so it was one of his first fuel injection systems that I hmm. guess he engineered. What kind of sensors did you even have on it at the time? I mean, uh, now you probably still don't have a whole we, lot more. Yeah, well, with the we run the Holly now, and it's as you know, there it's infinite. Yeah. You can pretty much put anything on them. But back then, there was very basic. You had your typical sensors that ran the the engine, but I think you only had like one or two inputs and outputs. Like there was very very yeah. little. You had to have all separate boxes to do everything. Yeah. You had to have your bump box, and then you had to have um, your ignition box because you Spark, had to run yeah. a. We ran a seventy five thirty one MSD box because it wouldn't do ignition. Yeah. It was a very basic con control strategy, but it worked and it kept the motor alive. So, even the big stuff—I mean, people still run that yes. in like Ultra Street and stuff. Yep. It it still holds up as long as you know what you're doing on it. I've, I know a couple people that are still very competitive with those, yeah. which is funny to see because a lot of like, you know, you talk to like Kevin Smith, who was just on here before this. <laughs> He's the data, like every sensor, he's yeah. like maxing out Holly ECUs and then adding like their extra pack to stuff. Yeah. So it's like the two ends of the spectrum where some people don't even have a shock sensor. Yeah. And yeah. then some have everything that you can imagine under the sun. It's yeah. uh, it's awesome to have the feedback because you can you can overlay runs now. And, and if we're running no time, so we don't get slips. So but if we overlay our passes that we know we did yeah. previous, we can tell if the car has been faster. You know, because you kind of get used to the car, you're not really sure if it did go faster. Um, you know, you get that kick in the in the pants seat feel, but other than that, it's like it feels like the same ride every single yeah. time. Well, especially too, like if it feels really fast, that may not actually have been a yes. fast pass. It's usually yeah. the it's usually the boring passes are the fastest passes. Yeah, and then sure. eighth mile too, it's so quick. It's yeah. just kind of like yeah, quarter mile. I, I always kind of make fun of it because that second 
no. portion is no fun. <laughs> no, it's not. I'm just holding on and praying that nothing's going to explode. <laughs> it's that, that's the biggest biggest fear. I was me. getting like anxious watching the pro mods go quarter mile because that's just yeah, that's insane. so much. I'm yes. just like, uh, yeah. I'm kind of like a little jittery. Like I can't imagine being in that thing going two. 60 out the back. Yeah, it's 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 unreal. Well, that's they're like doing. the allure of World Cup. It's like every pass one of those things could come apart and they're just hauling they're right down through there. Yep. Yeah, so and then you guys switched to no time for this year. Yes. Which was a probably not a bad decision cuz street cars a little weird. Yeah. I kind of got uh, not that I got tired. I got tired of chasing the rule changes and things. You know, we 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 did follow the rule changes for a period of time and then they got changed again, and I said, you know what, we'll just kind of put that to bed uh, and just move on to something else. And basically the car, uh, this is uh, the race that we just did at Snowbirds. That's our last race of the season. Uh, we're going to park the car. I'm building a new project right now, so we're going to take the drivetrain from it and install it in, in the other vehicle. And then uh, I'm going to probably do a small block single turbo setup in that car, and I think I may put him in the car. He, oh, wants, he nice. wants to start. Yeah, so Switch we'll do it up a little. Yeah, we're gonna try to uh, do some of those uh, uh, invitational and some of the street style stuff that mm -hmm. you're in. So we'll hopefully uh, hopefully be competitive. The street style, I mean, shoot, I won it, so <laughs> I would imagine you guys can be competitive. Yeah. But same combo, I'm small block single turbo. Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. Technically. Yeah. So. But the it's weird because the street car stuff, you almost have to like imagine what the rules will be next year because a big block twin turbo car yeah that combination on paper is basically unlimited yes like you know you you guys don't have that capability in your engine but on paper they yes. look at those rules and they're like well a big block twin turbo can make 5,000 horsepower so you have to assume all of them can do it yep and it's tough and you're on alcohol as well right yeah yeah we switched over to methanol in 17 and yeah. it's been been really not really uh, easy we had a couple of little learning curves but for the most part it's been really really good yeah the, the toughest part I think with the the car like the rule set from FL2K for streetcar shootout there were still cars that would with a big block that would be eligible for it. like Devin Vanderhoof's yes. Mustang still fits that rule yeah. set with the big block single and that car runs 670s I, I think he's been he's been 670s he can probably go significantly oh. faster but yeah. that was that was yeah. the that's just the one thing that and they have the car count, so they can tighten the rules now yeah. where it's tough. Like, I get when classes don't have car count, they have to, like, leave the rules open. But there was, like, 70 cars in streetcar. They got to tighten them just a little bit. But then the twin turbo Mustang cars are still so difficult to rule out, but they make so much power on T4 turbos that mm -hmm. it's so tough. Like, how, how can you a, – a 302 with T4 turbos making 3,000 horsepower. Yeah. How do you rule them where, out? Yeah, where, where does it end? <laughs> without ruling out yeah. everybody else, because an LS needs T6 turbos to make 2,000 horsepower. It's like... Yeah, and I think, uh, it, you know, Victor's always talking about doing like an Elite 8 or something like that, but I don't think there's enough cars yet to fill that field to get them real tight. Yeah. So maybe in the next year or so or two years from now, maybe there'll be enough cars and he'll be able to do something like that. The 28-inch tire class helps a lot. Yeah, the uh, Extreme, extreme Yeah, 28s, Extreme yeah. 28s and... You know, famously, you and Garrett oh, that double was awesome. entered. That was awesome. <laughs> and you were, you raised two finals in yeah. one, yeah, in that one was cool. race. Yeah, that that was that was probably like the pinnacle uh, uh, racing season. It was just awesome to do that. Plus, we did the shootout the Saturday night. That worked out pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty cool as well. So. The stick shift cars in that was cool. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, it was incredible that uh, it's incredible that that grub worm. Those cars can fly like that. It's just, it's awesome to see. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Like that car at like 1,200 feet is is tucking the nose farther down. Yes. Like it's it's still like, I would love to see the G meter on that thing because it's still tucking the nose farther and farther. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he was on the scramble trying to catch him on that pass, but like yeah. it's pretty cool to see. And it makes sense like that motor when you see it, like it has so many dang head studs to hold the heads on. Yes, yeah, so it's a conventional small block Chevrolet. It's just, uh, it was, they were engineered. One thing Chevy did right was put a lot of head bolts. I, I, I'm not a Ford guy per se, but I always said if we were going to do something and we had a bigger budget, I would be more prone to a, a Ford engine. Yeah. Just because of the cylinder head availability and things like that. Those small block Fords rev out too, which is yeah. nice. Like yeah. they, they give them some RPM. Yep. 
the val all the uh, short push rods, everything are shorter because the deck's a little bit higher, and it's a really really cool setup. They 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 hit it on the head when they were, when they engineered those things. Yeah, for and sure. then they say LS copied them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Basically, yeah. did the same thing. Well, it's like you said, the Godzilla is kind of like a oversized LS motor. Similar architecture to an LS, I would think. Yeah, but so it's, it's big displacement. Yeah, it's um, I mean, it's definitely a diversion from what Ford was doing with the Coyote yeah. in the previous generation, but. So getting back to the big block deal, yeah, I was uh, my first. I own my first car. I got when I was eighteen, and um, my dad and my uncle had a service station, and I was working for them. And they were gonna. They bought a big block to put it in a tow truck. We had a tow truck. So when I got this uh, car, I said, you know what, I'm gonna put a big block in it because back then we're talking in the eighties. Yeah. And uh, so I've always done big block Chevrolets. It's not because I was like, okay, I want to dominate a class. That's just, that's like the LS. That was the LS of, of, of racing at that point. You know, big block Chevrolet is, is what everybody ran if they were going to try to go a little faster and compete. So, mm -hmm. so we kind of just kind of ran with that ball and kept that type of platform in all the cars that we've done. Yeah, you run what you know. <laughs> exactly. Before, I mean, before it was like the thing. And it almost seemed like it took everybody a couple years to be like, oh, the big block in the street car is the way to go. Yeah. I don't yeah. because it always fit the rules and yeah. and you did it for four years before anybody else had a big block yeah. in that class. Yeah, it was like the front runners in that streetcar class was you, and it was um, the blue Mustang as well. Um, yeah, Mike Reich's Mike's yeah. car. Those were like front runners for a yeah. long time before Brett changed his car up, and it just I don't know. It seemed like a light bulb moment for a lot of people to do the big block. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm super impressed with Brett's car. We were, at, uh, we were at Orlando testing with my Swedish buddies, and I watched him go down when he went that 409. I think mm -hmm. he went 409. Yeah. That car is incredible. Like, it works They've got so it well. working really, really well, yeah. Well, he has to. He doesn't have the power. I mean, he's got a lot of power, but he doesn't have quite the power on tap like yeah. a lot of these cars he has to race with yeah. that can just, like, pour it in. Yeah. Yeah, uh, they're they're pretty smart dudes. They they know what they're doing. So yeah, they're getting all the props. getting all the efficiency out of that combo yeah. for sure. Yeah, and I'm sure they probably have a little left in it. Probably some. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's crazy to think a stock Ford block could have Can anything handle, left yeah. in it. Yeah, I mean, I think that. Almost any combination, like with, with drag racing, you can always pick up something to the 330, and yeah. that's where you're going to get it. Maybe not more out the back, but mm -hmm. you can definitely find some, you know, ET in the 330. So that's like uh, <clears throat> this no-time class that we just raced. Like, it's like LDR. The yeah, it's faster. The, it's faster, actually. <laughs> it's faster than LDR. Yeah. So I, we're seeing, for people that don't know, this no-time class that you guys raced, I will, as a not- as an outsider, I will say there's probably 370, 380 cars in there. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> easy. Like, no problem. Yeah. Troy Jr. <laughs> I'll tell you what, uh, David Reese, that uh, Chevy Nova, mm -hmm. that, that thing has got to be running 70s, I would assume. Holy crap. Yeah, and I don't even think he's still tickling it. Yeah. Because it's it's X275 and Pro 275 type of cars, Pro 275 really, and then they have no weight limit. Yep. No so weight limit, no engine limit. No, no engine nothing. limit. So Just you'll tire. Yeah. You'll see 900 cubic inch yep. motors with at 2,600 pounds, 2,400 pounds. Mm -hmm. Most of those cars, like the the Pro Charger blower and nitrous cars, are all they should all be sub 2,500 pound cars, and then yep. the turbo cars are probably between 25 and 28. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Like that Envy car that Troy Jr. runs mm -hmm. is just unreal. That yep. car works so well. Fireballs that are going yeah, over yeah. the roof, yeah. nitrous fireballs, and they got it very dialed in. Yeah, and yeah. you guys, um, you guys decided that was your class for this weekend. <laughs> well, the thing was with with that car, like you said before, we want to transition it back into doing like a small block single for like the Invitational and street style. So we're like, you know what? Let's just have some fun with the car. Yeah. It's it's running, and let's just run something with it. And yeah. we did get. Lucky at FL two K, I yeah, would say. Yeah, we dodged quite a few bullets. You know, it worked out, but you know, it is what it is. Everybody's gotta make it. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah, you kind of um you race the ladder and you get lucky sometimes. I I've we've all been there. We get yeah. a little lucky on the draw sometimes. Yeah. The two fastest guys end up racing yeah. first round or something, because no time's weird like that where it's not a qualifying sheet. No, nope. right. You race whoever. Did they do chip draw or was it chip draw first round? And then uh, actually, they they you drew the chip and they put you on the ladder. That's and nice. that's how it went. And then when we did Orlando at World Street Nationals two weeks ago, it was chip draw every round. Every round, yeah. I can't stand that. Yeah, it's too it's too hectic. 
You're they, waiting like 45 minutes in between every round just drawing chips when yep. you should be at your car doing yeah, something, doing something yeah. important. Yeah, Aaron definitely, he ran that really smooth, actually. That was probably one of the smoothest, like, chip draw every round we did. It was super mm -hmm. efficient. Yeah. But, yeah, a lot of them are can be a, can be a mess. Yeah, it gets <laughs> hectic very quickly. Okay. That was happening pretty, and then people end up missing a race because they weren't even paying attention that they had exactly. a chip draw coming. And then you got to put everything back in, <laughs> redraw. Mm -hmm. no, you're done. If you miss it, you're out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. we've fought with that, that a couple times at Troy's races, which they run them well, but... As a racer, it just gets a little tedious. Sure. Yeah. So you guys were running that this weekend. What was your experience there? I think it was great. We had we actually what we again we were we brought it out to have some fun. Obviously knew that we were up against a wall with all the fast cars that were in there, but we decided we're just going to try to set personal best goals, and we actually hit it. We hit our personal best again this weekend. Yeah. So I was very very happy with the car. Were they given slips when you hit that, or was it just based on? Yeah, uh, in in uh, test passes, we were getting slips, and then yesterday there were none. But I think we went fast, even faster. Yeah, yesterday. we went fast. We put more power in it yesterday for eliminations, and it on the, according to the G meter and the drive shaft, it went faster. So we have an idea of what it went. Yeah, but uh, hard to say. You yeah. can't can't really say unless you have that slip, I guess. Yeah, you could just kind of. Well, then there's the people that pull the records in the no time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they yeah. try to. <laughs> Chris Dealman out here tries to pull records and no time stuff. <laughs> but that car seems to work so well short track, which is nice. Like, it separates so well for something that was, like, I mean, you've had it together for, what would you say? Since, since 15, 2015. We, we brought yeah. it up in 15, yeah. For it to still be working so well with, yeah. you know. It's a, ba it's a basic much, setup. I, I actually originally was building it. We were going to do something like X275, and at the time, you got a weight break. Or sorry, not that you got a weight break. You couldn't run a four link. So, but ladder bars were acceptable. Unless it was factory style, like a Mustang yep. or G body yeah. or something like that. So I built a, a ladder bar, built my own setup, and uh, put it in the car. And with radial tire uh, setup, you have to position your bracketry in a specific spot on the car. Otherwise, you won't get the separation. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of big tire cars, when they transition, they're really low in the back because they got to move everything up for it to set, create that anti squat and. I basically got lucky, I think. I put the bars put in, the in, the exact, right in the exact spot. In the exact spot. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know nothing about it at well, the time. Well, you came off of leaf spring cars. Yeah, it was a leaf spring car, yeah. Well, not own. that, but the previous drag car, like the wagon was a leaf spring car, yeah. so we didn't yeah, know so anything about it. Yeah, pretty different. Yeah. yeah. And those to. things just naturally separate, so you're... And I bought long shocks, which, by mistake, I bought long shots, shocks, which you need, <laughs> long mm -hmm. travel. And it all it all worked out. And then we started paying attention and seeing, I go, okay, why, why are these cars doing all this? Like... And then you start understanding they're they're driving that tire into the ground and they're trying to get the nose planted so it won't wheelie. So it, it kind of makes it made all sense at yeah. that point. And, so. and the RX-7, you have to do that. It's 96 inches yeah. long and we run significantly more nose weight just to keep it down. Yep. And it it works. It's not, you know, it's you can only go so fast, I think, with that deal because it's 3,500 pounds yep. and it'll do that 111, 60 foot almost every time you try to go a little bit faster and it doesn't like yeah, it. it just gets upset because like it tries to pick up the nose or it no, just it'll, spin. To it'll, like spin, it'll yeah. spin yeah you're because you're putting so much power in it to try to do that and like you're like we're going through the 60 foot at like 35 pounds of boost and it's like it's making pretty good steam at that point and that there's that fine line of a couple of pounds of boost or a couple of degrees of timing and it'll knock the tire off so it's super finicky right there. Yeah. yeah. And then once you get out past the 60 foot, you're probably yeah. just tossing it all in as Pretty much, much as you can. Yeah. As but fast if, as you can bring it in. Yeah. Yeah. But like at least for that, then we figured out, okay, if you can go 111, it'll pretty much go down every time. It's funny you guys talk about like the wheelbase because I hear, like, I talk to so many people and, and everybody's like, oh, it's too long of wheelbase. You guys are like, oh, it's too short of wheelbase. And there's like this perfect zone that seems like it's, S197 is in the perfect zone of wheelbase, like the newer Mustangs. What, what yeah, are they, like 108? 108, I think. I think they're like yeah. 108. They yeah. seem like they just that's nailed the sweet it. Spot. That's yeah. the same as the Camaros, too. The, yeah. um, like six, like the like your, your Camaro's a Camaro. 108. Like, yeah, it's yeah. a good it's a yeah. good wheelbase, yeah. yeah. But then it just has stupid torque arm, <laughs> which uh, isn't horrible. It just looks like it's got ladder bars, but uh, one ladder bar. Yeah, a lot yeah. of guys went really fast in that torque arm still. Yeah. Like, there were some LDR cars, like older LDR cars when the class used to be outlaw drag radial, 
they um, when they transitioned it over, a lot of guys were still running torque arms yeah. and, and that type of car, and they were going O's with the it, torque arm. It can work, but it's just it's just weird because if if you catch it just right, it'll try to wheelie. Like, right, it'll try to ride the pinion so hard that it'll just like nose up, and then you. Mm-hmm. Cut, you're in a whole different world at that point. Yeah, yeah. You can't you can't do any instant center adjustment on it, forward or back, to change your pickup point. You can just change it up and down, pretty much like a ladder bar. Yeah. It's and then there's like bar. a mystery too. You talk to like five different people that are all going fast, and they all have different opinions on why they're doing it. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, okay, who do I listen to here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because they all have different opinions. They all do things differently, and I'm like, all right, well, I guess I'll just keep trying my own deal. Well, our our biggest uh, asset. Lately, our, our biggest change on the car is we added, uh, we, we, we put two more percent of nose weight on the car to keep it from wheeling, and that ended it. We put, basically, I put a 75-pound lead weight on the front of the car, mm-hmm. and that completely almost eliminated for, the wheelie. For you guys doing math, that's 2%. Yeah. 75 pounds. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you guys trying to calculate the weight on the car. <laughs> well, yeah. well it's, it's where you hang the weight, too, because it's as far forward as you can possibly. Yeah, it's literally it. touching the and grill. Like so, because the car, before we did that, the car was 3425. Yeah. And then now it's 35 right on the number. That's race pretty weight. crazy how heavy it is. It's heavy. Yeah. yeah. For a JDM car, you know. Everything's there. Like, if you look in that car... There's not a single, like, you know, when they build all the steel roof quarter cars now, they're just, just skins. skins. There's nothing mm-hmm. there. It's and full inner structure. The whole car is whole still. Yeah. It's got power windows, power moonroof. It's got a lot of the factory floor, too. Yeah. It's got part of the um, the rear frame rail there, like, at least the inside part. Mm-hmm. I tried to, um, I, when I built the car, I tried to make sure I covered all my bases on being legal so they can't oust you out of a class. So Yeah, that's the tough part because, you know, now it's that old of a car. Yeah. And it's like or that old of a build, yep. that rules change, classes change, and you either have to change with them or yep. try to find different classes that you fit in. Yep. And thankfully, your car is street style enough where it'd be really hard to rule it out of anything. Yep. Right. But you also don't have that, like you're talking about adding weight, you don't have that much nose over the front tires. Like no. my car has like all this nose room over the front end, like past the front tires yep. to hang stuff. I could put like a a lever out there basically mm-hmm. right because that's how you kind of got to think about it like a lever far off and you people put those butthurt bars on the back of yeah, the yeah, cars yeah, yeah basically do the same thing on a radial car exactly <laughs> move all the weight yep yep but i i think that i know most cars they're i mean it depends on power and combination and all that but no i don't know of many cars that are running over 60% nose weight, kind of like we have to do, mm-hmm. but that's the only way to get it to work. And I just think it's because of the wheelbase. Yeah, it's just the wheelbase and the, the torque of that engine. It's. I think with a small block, we probably are not going to have to run nearly as much weight on the front of that thing. Yep. It's probably going to make significantly less torque. From an outsider, I feel like your success on that car has been like kind of the slow hammer technique of like you're not making any major changes. You're not like you know, it didn't get down the track, so you're like, let's throw everything at it now. It's just been like yeah, consistent incremental yep. stuff where a lot of people try to get ahead of themselves on like, oh, the car's 60 footed and went down the track, like first pass out, and they're like, turn it up. Now what will it make yep. yeah. type of thing. And yeah, yeah. we try to play smart. We try to look at the competition, who we're racing, and we just kind of make adjustments depending on who we're going to line up next to. Mm-hmm. You know, Now you probably have so many tune-ups too for heat of the day. Yeah, greasy track. It, it comes down to Gainesville. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it comes down to tune-up, shock adjustment, and uh, basically, pretty much it. Just power suspension management, suspension travel in the front. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and even like on a track like, I hate to dog on Gainesville too much, but like on a track like that where it's not marginal prep compared to Bradenton, yeah. where it's like a glue trap. We uh, we had su- we've had success in Gainesville, but we also we went up there for the 352 just this past uh, while, and uh, we we couldn't get down the track. And I I don't blame the track because we actually found a problem with the car after the fact because it didn't get down Orlando the first pass, and yeah. we're like, all right, something's wrong here because we didn't even have it turned up or anything, and it just wouldn't go. So basically, when I scaled the car, I put the weight in the seat because I had to get underneath it to look at it, and. Uh, uh, I didn't have the weight in the correct position, so it was giving the rear suspension a, a false reading. So the anti roll bar was actually touching the chassis. So there, oh. it was, even though the cars separate, they still squat just a tick off the hit, and it was hitting the tire and unloading the tire right, right, right off the hit. So, yeah. so I can't blame Gainesville for that. That was our mistake. Yeah, and when you go to Gainesville, like it's it's a 
Derek does a great job with that event. Yep. You just you just have to know if you're running on a 275, you ha- you just have to know you have to slow, slow it down. Yeah, you're not going to run to your potential basically. Yeah, like everybody, you have to understand the track. Like yep. a lot of a lot of us racers, we get like very territorial, I guess, about like the track wasn't there, but like you kind of have to race the track. That's of what's course. fun yeah. about Sick yeah. Week is you have to race all these tracks and like. Gainesville is a tough one, yeah, yep. and it's going and it's going to be, and yep. especially on sick week when there's 350 cars that have to go down it, it's and, going to be a tough one. Yeah, and if you know your car and you know what to do, you should be able to make it work on almost any track. That's yep. why, like somebody like Devin Vanderhoof went down every track first pass. Yeah, I hated that guy all week. I'd watch <laughs> him at the checkpoints; like it'd still be like morning, and he'd be at the next checkpoint yep. already, and I'm like. <laughs> this freaking guy, man. Yeah, I and mean, he's. I'm, I know he's had that car for a really long time, so he probably knows it inside and out too. Yeah. They just switched over to twins on it. Yeah, it looks pretty good like that. Those big heart turbo oh, twin yeah. setup. I'm be curious to see. Yeah, how they, they, they. That's another program that they do a beautiful job on everything that they do. Like it's top notch. Mm-hmm. He's super meticulous yep. about everything, and obviously he's a well known tuner. And yeah, so he's of a things. smart, really smart guy. Like I've. I've um, gotten some information from him in the past because we were when we were starting to play with the holly stuff and he's very very knowledgeable on that when stuff. did you guys switch over to holly i always thought Seven, it was on 17 i think 17 oh, so okay. when we first did the car you went with fast xfi 2.0 yeah. because in the the wagon we had it went from xl to big stuff and then you wanted a, the fast was 2.0 was a little bit of an upgrade from big stuff because I think that was we could run 16 injectors. Yeah, you do 16 like injectors. That. It had a bunch of built-in features and it had a bunch of inputs and outputs. That yeah, you could add. and the Holly, I don't know when the Dominator came out. Maybe like 2012 ish, mm-hmm. somewhere around there. So it was the Holly was still really new. It was still like version two stuff, and we didn't we didn't really know anything about it. So we went with the there was a couple guys that we knew like in our racing world that ran the fast. So we're like, oh, let's let's do a fast. And I don't know what was going on with it. We just had issues with it that weren't really explainable. Yeah. So we uh, put the big stuff from the wagon in the car, and very first pass, it went personal best. Like, not even – all the problems went away. Yeah. yeah. So and that was when the car was still on C16 intercooled, and we ran it like that up to 2017. And then we switched over to methanol with the Holly. Yeah. What was the reason behind the C16? So I always wonder why people run the fuel that they do. If it's like, that's just what you know, or if that's what the guys told. Yeah. Like, I, th- I think it's probably we we you know you look at other people and say, okay, we need a high octane fuel uh, if we're going to run 40 plus pounds of boost. But we were also in water to air intercooled, so we had a good, really good intercooler. Yeah. But we just kind of ran with the with the C16. Q, yeah, I know Q16. I'm I'm more of a fan of Q16, but at that time we didn't really know much about it, and we just stuck with the C16, like you said. Yeah. And it's it's not my favorite fuel, but it works. I always avoid methanol because it's just I don't know. I always feel like I see the most failures when people start to try to turn their cars up on methanol. Mm, on I, LS cars, I always see head gaskets just leaving. It, that's that's more of an architectural problem because you're throwing so much more volume of fuel yeah. in the cylinder. You're basically hydrolocking the cylinders. Yeah, the, trying to push the heads off, dumping fuel. In yeah, there. you you have to clamp the heads like no matter what. Like the small block Ford stuff, it was the same thing because they only have eight head bolts. Uh, before guys were doing copper O ring or fire hoops and all that, they were. It was the same deal. You'd pop head gaskets, but now you clamp those things down, and the the rods become the weak link. Yeah. <laughs> so even the block. I mean, you see these LS yeah. blocks that are just like completely shattered. Gone. Like yeah. it oh, just yeah. can't even. Even cracking heads. Like the first time I heard somebody crack a head on an LS, I was like kind of in shock. I was like, mm. that's a thing. Like, must have been really leaning on that thing. Oh yeah. Our our learning curve with the methanol was uh, oil contamination and oil pressure. Like you have to make sure you have a lot of oil pressure, mm-hmm. and you have to keep the oil clean. Yeah, I think I've seen you guys boiling it before. Yeah, that's what we do. I, I usually buy about four cases of oil a season, and we just rotate it. Uh, you'll lose a little bit in the boiling process, but we basically just boil it, cool it, and dump it right back in the motor. So you just have like a little crawfish style. Yeah, little cooker. little turkey, little turkey pot, and a little uh, a little burner, and well, just a spigot on the bottom. Yeah, and <laughs> boil it out and drain just it out. Drain it off. You filter it just to make sure there's nothing mm-hmm. in it. It always comes back out spotless. Hmm. And it returns back to its original form. Like, it just looks perfect. I wouldn't mind trying to do that with my oil because it gets expensive when you're just... What, what are you using for oil? I use pen grade. That's yeah. what we use, yeah. yeah. I use the Nitro 70 just because it gives us a little better oil pressure. Yeah. It's that green stuff. Everybody's yeah. always like, why is it green? I'm yeah. like, oh, it should be greener. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, yeah, I'm not sure, like, with... Because you're on... You're running... Are you running E90? 
Yeah. So I don't know. Like I know with gasoline, like well, with yellow, it's E ninety eight. Oh, E ninety eight. Yeah, it's not the red. I don't know. I'm curious. I'm sure you could probably boil it. Yeah, I'm, you can. I've boiled. It's I've, mostly alcohol. Yeah. I've boiled uh, a VR twenty fifty with on on the methyl. Well, I'm saying with on, the, ga- on gas with a specific fuel because alcohol is mostly water. Does it get milk? Or not pretty milky. Water. Not too bad. The milky is usually just the catch can, but it puts a good amount in the catch can, unfortunately, because trying to. We're asking a lot of boost from that little yeah, yeah. Three, three liter. You know, it's 65, 70 pounds of boost. Yeah. How Some big of your, it's going to get past the rings. That's how big crazy. is the catch can? It's five quarts. Okay. So, yeah, yeah that, that's the thing. When we went to alcohol, our because we still we had a tiny catch can that was maybe only, it probably only held like three quarts. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. And it would push like crazy. Mm-hmm. So, we went with the big catch can and vented the engine properly and, and baffled it and it's, it works very, very little. Now. Plus, it's in the it's behind the rear wheels. Yeah, in case so we have it, a failure. Man, I can't stand when I see guys that race their cars a lot that just have like a little underhood catch can. It's dangerous. It's so scary. It's yeah. like you're like you can't you can't do what you're doing. Yep. And expect that to never be a problem. Like you, sh- you should have enough volume of of catch as what the engine holds, mm-hmm, basically. Yeah. Yeah. At least between the lines yeah. and the catch can, because, yeah. like, you know, you got two dash 10s or dash 12s running back there. That'll yeah. hold a lot in its own. So, speaking of um, catch cans and. Oh, last night. Oh, last night. Did you see uh, Mark Woodruff go down the track last night, the yellow uh, Z06 Corvette? I watched a couple of his passes. I don't think I saw his so issue. So, in, I think it was E2. And that's a badass so car. So, E2, mm-hmm. he went down right before the no time. So, I'm standing on the starting line. And it was just white smoke, like, okay, he, he goosed the engine in that thing. So we're thinking, all right, this is probably going to be an hour delay. The spotters walk out there, nothing on the track. And then I talked to James, and he was like, yeah, ever since he he blew the motor up once at U.S. Street Nationals there and wrecked the car, he put one of the most serious containment pans underneath that thing, and he can explode an engine, nothing will drop on the track. Yeah, that's convenient, yeah, because I've had a couple issues, like a TX2K a transmission. Yeah, I had remember some that. Issues yeah. and everything was in the pan, and thank goodness, because TX2K, <laughs> I hate to add a delay to a oh, track yeah. that's already full of delays. Oh, I yeah, hate yeah. to be that guy. <laughs> I've been that guy many a times, but I hate to be that guy. <laughs> and yeah, you that, guys know that, how that is. That race seemed like there was a sh- ton of breakage, just like, a t- like a, it almost seemed like... Yeah. All the cars, every time they go down, they'd be broke, and then try to pull over and mm-hmm. get off the track. And you guys just... haven't been back since then, right? That was no. the last one. Yeah, that was a one and done. Like I think twenty twenty one. I think it was. Yeah, twenty one. Yeah, it's just we uh, we we beat ourselves that race. We've we've beaten ourselves at two major races just for some miscommunication errors. Uh, that's when we raced. Uh, as Brett, Brett, Brett yeah. clipped us at the start yeah. at the finish line. So, so we have uh, radios in the car, mm-hmm. which I think is one of the. Uh, one of the best features yeah. you can have if you have somebody helping you out outside. Especially if you're only like one crew guy and a driver. Yeah. It's, it's usually it's just awesome. my wife. I don't know what right. she would say to me. About yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She'd be like, what's going on? Why yeah. are you not taking the light? <laughs> you just click it off. Click. Yeah, as you're, well, as you're sitting there like staging and she's like, why aren't you getting in? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, you got to go radio silence once you, as soon as that first bulb goes on, you got to go radio silence because normally if, we're beating somebody, and it's like, because especially quarter mile, there's no need to run the car out if you're already way out on them. So mm-hmm. I'll just get on the radio, hey, like just shut, shut the up. car down. Yeah. And when we raced Brett, we went out and we were out on him through the 330. And I got on the mic for whatever reason, because I was like excited because we were out in front. And then it, it was kind of staticky for him. So he thought I said let out. So at 4.5, he clipped it. And we rolled wow. through it a 720, and he went like 711 or something. Yeah. It was like margin of victory was like, I don't know, seven hundredths of a second or less than that. Man, but he kind of gave it to him on that one. A so little he's bit. got, yeah, he's got his fingers on the button saying, "Go, go, go!" Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking he's saying, "Let out." <laughs> so I just let out. <laughs> at so Gainesville FL2K, whatever it was, two years ago when we were at Gainesville, yeah. I got back on the gas because. I got out of it and I felt the guy like I oh, could yeah. hear his car, so I was like, "Oh no!" And <laughs> yeah. the parachute was out already. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. Thankfully, the nitrous lights the turbo pretty quick, yeah, but right. I had to get back, back in, in it. it. Yeah, because he would have he would have been there yeah. on me. So and that's that's the thing with quarter mile racing because you're you're so hesitant to go that extra bit and you're kind of soft on the gas towards the end if you know you're out in front of the guy, yeah. but. Well, eighth mile stuff, it's like, uh, you got to just yeah. ring it to the eighth. So quick, shut it doesn't it off. Even matter. Yeah. Yep. Yesterday in Pro Mod, I watched a similar situation where one first round, 
first car didn't even leave the line. The other car leaves the line. He's all over the place. He clips the cone and then gets past, gets through the, the beams. But, like, he clipped the cone, so he right, was out. Done, and yeah. the other guy didn't even leave the line. And I was like, man, his spotter did a horrible job oh. on that one. Like, <laughs> you got to be kicking yourself if you have a free run and you just. Yeah. So so in no, uh, the no time rule yesterday was it's worse to. Uh, cross, cross than it is to hit the, wall. hit the wall. If you hit the wall, you're still you're still good. Hmm. So well, no, so you're still good. Yeah. You're still good if the guy crosses the center line. So that's what they explain. So if you if you red light and the guy goes down and hits the wall or crosses the center line, the red light doesn't automatically end the race. Yeah, you still have to not cross or hit the wall. Yeah, I think the reason they do the crossing the center line is worse just for the safety of the drivers. Because they don't want you to drive through it if you're going towards the center line. I mean, you've seen so technically, stuff if, that if you think you've like crossed, that. you you would naturally want to let out. Yeah, they don't. They they'd rather you stay away from the other car. I guess you're kind of yeah. being more penalized if you cross the center. Yeah, that's I mean, my thought. I've at least. seen some cars hit the wall where it's just like the bullhorn bounces oh, yeah. off the wall, yeah. and it's not even like the car's fine. And it just got a bent bullhorn. Yeah. So sometimes that can help you there, but. Yeah, it's weird on that rules, and I guess the starter has to decide because James had some problems yesterday too in first round of Ultra Street where, you know, he had he pulled through, like rolled through doing his burnout, and then let me try to explain this enough to where everybody gets it. The other car, they told him to just go in because James was kind of like messing around. Nate was in the car. They had some solenoid issues, so they're kind of trying to rewire it. And then they told the guy to just take the beams and go in. The guy never did. But apparently he turned off his nitrous bottle. So then he like kind of waited for James, even though they told him he could go in. It wasn't two minutes yet. They both take the beams together. The guy that was supposed to go in took the beams, and then James beat him because he didn't really get wow. off the line. He had no nitrous. Uh. But then at the top end, the guy's like, oh, I won. But James is like, no, I have a win light. You lit both bulbs. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, that's the starter's discretion there. Like you said. It wasn't two minutes, though. Like, we have video. It was only, like, a minute and 40 seconds. So yeah. the starter really shouldn't have made the call to DQ mm. James. Right. And then he won. So it was, like, kind of a little debate there. Yeah. But That's a tough thing. That's like when uh, at FL 2K, when um, it was uh, Larry in the orange Nissan. Oh, yeah. When Remember when I think the other guy rolled through the beams or something when they were both staged, and then he his car shut off or something. So the other guy rolled through the beams, so he was automatic red light, and then Larry's car shuts off. Well, Larry still has to start the car and at least roll the beams, and, and then he can the back car, it yeah. out. And you can't touch the car. And they once were touching it. They uh, they backed it out and touched it. So then that came up to I think it was probably Victor's decision to say, hey, what are what are the rules on this? Yeah, it's interesting when those kind of like tough decisions mm -hmm. come and they have to either go to Victor, which is tough because then it's like, are you playing favorites in any yeah. way? Because it kind of happened at TX2K, I think, with those with White Rice and Larry. Oh, yeah. Where White Rice's um, reflective wheels oh, yeah, or something yeah, was yeah, flickering yeah, yeah, the beams. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And then they let him rerun it. But it's kind of tough. And like, is that a favoritism thing? I think ah. it was, I think Larry was a gentleman, had him do it. But at the same time, it kind of, Got him burned at the end of that. He it, lost. Yeah, he lost, and he had the win, so I don't know. It's tough. And the same with James's situation. If I was that guy's spotter, I'd be like, don't take the beams because you already won. So once you line up, like you're mm -hmm. basically accepting the race. Right. Yep. Or if he wanted to take the win, he should have taken the beams while James was, you know, past the tree, yeah. screwing around in the car and stuff. I don't know. It's a tough one. Do you remember hearing about all the um, the timing system mishaps oh, yeah. a couple of years ago with uh, when they were doing one of the radial series? I think it was in Virginia, right? It could have I been. I think it was in Virginia. So they had a radial race in Virginia, like a ducks type race, mm -hmm. and all of the RVW cars are going like because they normally go on a three fifteen nine two nine three sixty foot. They started going like 870, 60 foots. Like, like out of nowhere. Yeah. And these yeah. cars are on rails normal. Like they normally run the same thing every they time. They know the data so well. Yeah. yeah. So they're setting all these. Every class is setting these records, and it's like, okay, this this LDR car is going sub one second, 60 foot. It's a turbo car. Like, how is it doing that? But then you look at the time slip, and that ET that they lost on this or that they made up in the 60 foot showed up in the reaction time. 
because the beam didn't trip until the car was already in motion. Already in motion, or the car was halfway in motion, ha- yeah. or, and then it tripped the beam. So uh, I think Donald Long gets on um, uh, Facebook Live or something and was talking about it, and he's like, "So you're telling me this guy who's basically a professional driver running RVW is cutting a 150 light?" And he's going an 870, 60 foot. So normally, if he, if he goes 050 light, it's actually a 92, 60 foot. Mm-hmm. So he's like, so they had they had all every. I'm pretty sure they set records in almost every class. They had to take they had everything to scrub back. All, they had yeah. to scrub all the records oh, because the timing system was messed up. The records in classes like that just I I don't really care about them anyways because the rules are so tight that like the record this year couldn't mean might not mean anything next year anyways yeah. because the rules change. Yeah. So it's almost like. It's weird to be like, oh, it's the record in X275 trim, but like Correct. of 2019 or, uh, you know what I mean? You almost have to preface it with a year mm-hmm. yes, because it doesn't really matter. Like even White Rice, I think, went the fastest um, X275 car ever. Yeah. It went like a 413 this weekend. But it doesn't really mean that much because, yes, it's fast, but the rules are always changing. Yeah, that... That 2J combo in the X275 is nasty because it's like, all right, they're, you know, you're limited on your displacement. You're, you know, three liters or what is it, mm-hmm. 3.2 or 3.3, you can get them to. Yeah. But they make so much mile an hour with the 88 because it's a good, you know, turbo good, to engine. balance. So if they're running the same size turbo as like a 400 plus inch Chevy or Ford motor, the 2J is way more efficient on that turbo. Yeah. Well, they work on that car a lot. Oh, yeah. Too. The cylinder heads are off that car. Almost every pass, the yeah. cylinder head is off that car <laughs> pretty constantly. So, like, that's the flip side of that is where, you know, Ryan Milliken, the other, like, runner-up, like, the other fastest car in that class, he probably never touches that engine. Oh, yeah. That's, <laughs> like, the, di- that's the diesel? The yeah. diesel one, yeah. yeah. And that thing's, like, he, I think he always jokes that it can run the same pretty much with a rod hanging out the block because those... Cummins engines don't really care. Oh, yeah. It's kind of like you guys, the <laughs> school bus engine. Yeah, school exactly. bus engine. <laughs> the big block and the Cummins are the school bus engines. Yeah, that's pretty much it, yeah. And they have a lot of displacement, too. I think it's a 5.9. Yeah. It's not like it's a small no, six-cylinder. it's not a small one. Yeah, I'm always surprised how those those diesels work because, you know, you usually think, a, you know, a turbo limited, you don't want to go crazy with cubic inch. And that that diesel, it because they go – so I know, like, most of the, um, the small block guys, like small block Ford Chevy guys – they can only get like 175, 177 and X on that turbo. Mm-hmm. And like, I, I'm pretty sure Ryan Milliken's probably like 182, 183. And then White Rice, they're well over 180. Yep. It's just crazy how much more they can do with that turbo versus a V8. His EGTs must be wild. Oh, yeah. That thing's I can probably imagine. Hot at the end of the track. I can imagine. <laughs> Trying to run that thing quarter would be unreal. Yeah. Because yeah. I've often wondered about that on like a street style because – and we'll get into drag and drive stuff. Like, would that be a very good drag and drive combination I, of some sort? I think there was a Chevelle that was a diesel Chevelle that did one of the drag and drives. I don't know how years he was ago. Insane. There was a diesel Mustang years ago. Yeah, that's right. Ten. Yep. yep. Um, he was. I remember the hot. You have the the hot rod magazine in in your shop because I think you were you were in, there was an article in there, but they had this diesel Mustang on the cover of like Hot Rod twenty ten or eleven or something for from Drag Week. And the the heading was like gets thirty two miles to the gallon, yeah. like drag and drive. I'm like, wow, that's yeah, that's cool. what I would think. Like, once you're cruising in that thing, yeah. it's probably great on gas. Like fifteen hundred RPM, twelve hundred RPM, just mm-hmm. rolling. And they're like, heavy too, so the rules can't really do no. anything to you. Yeah. Like, you're yeah. already heavier than the whole field. It was a SN ninety five. I think it was a Dur- yes. it was a Duramax diesel. Is what it yeah, was. Yeah, I don't even think it was. A I think Cummins. it was the guy that uh, I don't know if he owned Nitrous Express or he was he was affiliated with Nitrous Express. Hmm. So and he had this big old diesel in his Mustang. It was it's pretty interesting to see different forms of engine dis- engine styles yeah. in cars. It's that's what's fun about those dragon drives. They kind of bring out like a different person yeah. Yeah. completely. Because like us class racers are kind of like a different breed than like the guys that well, I'm not as much of a class racer. I don't have the I don't have the budget for an Ultra Street or X275 type of car. <laughs> those those budgets are wild, even though they're. Going mm-hmm. as fast as no time cars, they have to be so you gotta on the money. Yeah, 
Well, that's where you started from was Dragon Drive yeah. back in 07. 07 yeah. Before it was really even like a thing, though. Yeah. Because it was only like, what, one of them? Yeah, a uh, drag, I did Drag Week in 07. How and many cars were in that? It was maybe a hundred, maybe a hundred cars. And that was back when it was probably a lot more laid back. Yeah, I think I think the uh, the, the the fast cars were, uh, uh, Lar Larry Larson's car wasn't fast. I think he still had a blower on his car. It wasn't the truck at the time, right? No, no, it was, it was a Nova. It was Nova. A, it was pink at the time. Yeah, it okay. had a roots blower yeah. on it. And then um, Mike Roy, uh, I guess Larry Larson. Uh, do, you, do you know who Mike Roy is? He's got a big a '70 Monte Carlo. It's, it's burgundy, like a burgundy colored mm -hmm. car. I know it if I saw it. He was heavy duty into Pro Charger when Pro Charger came out, so he uh, he took his car to Larry Larson's shop and they back halved it and made it a big tire car and basically was a a, a, a big block Pro, uh, Pro Charger setup and he was running pretty good, but. The car was heavy. It was another 4,200-pound car, and at the time, I don't think the transmission technology had gotten there yet with bigger bigger components in the turbo, turbo 400s, and they just kept breaking transmissions. Hmm. But, uh, yeah, the early drag-and-drive stuff was – it was a lot less hectic because we didn't have so many cars. Uh, the routes were, were, were way longer than they are now. Uh, we, there was one year that we ran 1,400 miles. Oh wow! And it was just miserably hot, and yeah. it was just it was uh, it was grueling. Where was that one at? Was it? We went from uh, we went from uh, uh, Memphis to Tulsa, back to Tulsa, I think. Oh wow! Interesting. I think. Interesting Memphis. tracks. Yeah. I always think of them as like kind of like a Virginia almost. Yeah. Right now, now they used to start like right in the Midwest. It was a lot of like you used to go to Can Topeka, Topeka, Kansas, Kansas. Yeah. Amarillo, Texas. Yeah. It was a lot of Midwest mm -hmm. tracks. Yeah. Well, now there's so many drag and drives for people to get into that kind of pick your deal. Pick your area and go Down to Down here, it. I think we did like, what, 900 miles? Yeah, eight, eight and change. Yeah, it wasn't crazy, but Florida's also pretty boring. Yeah. To, like, it's hard to make that route exciting. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's all flat and straight. They kind of had to put us on the highway a little bit, which... Well, when you, when you, when you do drag and drives and you've been through those big, uh, long uh, runs, we'd, look, we'd get our dra drive sheet... Oh, it's it's 270 miles. Oh, my, oh, this is awesome. We used to do 400 in one stint, so it'd be like 270 was just was no problem. You know? And how was that one set up? Was it like a drive day, race day? Like, because nope. now we kind of it's the same format as it is now. Yeah, you would you, you just uh, get your turn your ticket in, get loaded up, and go, and you'd have to be at the track the next morning. There was yeah, no, there was no extra drive day or anything like that. Kind of just have to leave people behind if yep. you can. Yep. Yeah, yeah. But, I always I always laugh at the first timers because a couple of people like they'd be like oh like you know we'll ride together we'll cruise together I'm like yeah like maybe yeah <laughs> if, yeah. like you know if it works out you kind of yeah. have to get to the next spot if one of your friends is broken down mm -hmm. you want to help them but like you also have to get moving because you yep. might be broken down oh, in a yeah. hundred miles well, if you don't the the one year in sixteen when we did it the last year we did drag week yep. with the RX seven um, we were one of our our buddies that we've we've known forever he. Uh, he was riding, or he rides with Lutz for all of his dragon drives in the mm -hmm. Mad Max and the um, when he used to have the other Chevy twos. So we were gonna be, we're like, oh, after the first day, you know, we'll cruise with you guys. So it was us, Lutz, and uh, Lutz's his, son, Lutz's son, and a couple Honda. other guys. Yeah. And we get out there, and we didn't, we don't have gear vendors in the car, and they've got giant tires, and we're on the 28. So we're cruising, going like 60, and then Jeff passes by us, probably doing 85 mile an hour in that Pro Mod, just on yep. just gear vendors just rolling and then we're like all right see you guys i guess we're not riding with you five miles up the road we see them pulled over and there's freaking smoke coming out of the <laughs> they're overheating, on, overheating. <laughs> <laughs> or just just going right by them yeah. well, they i think they probably had like when when because jeff still has the record for fastest average yeah 619 i think is his average yeah yeah in in 16 he did it so our buddy scott was riding with them i think that they they didn't sleep at all yeah. The most they would sleep is like two hours on the side of the road. Like they didn't go to the he, hotel. He had a lot of engine issue, oiling issues because he, he hurt the crank. Oil, they, well, they're putting well, bearings in it on the that side. That was of the, the year road. before. Oh, but okay. This year was fuel pumps and yeah. they would they would burn up fuel pumps and then they would have they would be driving with they would have the generator running on the wheelie bars of the car, charge with the battery charger hooked up because they couldn't charge the car, fuel pumps were failing, and then they they pretty much would race and then just drive all the way through the night and go right to the track. Yeah. It was, I don't know how those guys did it. Like Jeff, the one day at, um, where we at in Milan, Michigan? Was it Milan? No, it US was 131. US 131, Martin, Michigan. Martin, yeah. Michigan. 
we're sitting in the staging lanes getting ready to go, and he's just, like, sitting. He's got his full race suit on, sitting next to his pro mod, leaning up against his tire, just sleeping. Yeah. That's what's fun about those events, because no matter how much money somebody has into their car, we're all in the same boat. Oh, yeah. Like, nobody's in their stacker. No. It's a trish. Home. Like, yeah. Yeah. We're all in the same. Like, no matter what car you got, you could be in a stock Crown Vic. You're struggling pretty much oh, just the same yeah. as, like, the guy in his pro mod. Yeah. Which is, which is cool. That's why there's that camaraderie oh, yeah. of, like, you could be cruising down the highway and your car is broken and people you don't know will stop and yeah, help you. Help you. And, and everybody, that, I would say the majority of people that do drag and drives, they'll do some crazy stuff to get their cars going back again. Like the in 16, uh, we hurt a lifter in it. When we, we made it to the checkpoint, we heard a lifter chirping. So we took it apart. We're like, okay, it took out a lifter. Like, well, we can shove a lifter in and keep going, but we still had three more race days or the cam's probably eaten on it, that load. And that was the first time I brought a spare cam. I had a used one sitting there. I said, you know, I'll bring this camshaft. You never know. As a wild thing to pass. <laughs> yeah. so, and, then, yeah. <laughs> and then so we're like, okay, let's just take it apart. So a bunch of guys were hanging out. That was, um, remember all the, the Swedish guys that they, there was probably like 10 guys in one RV, like these Swedish guys that were hanging out with us. Mm -hmm. And they were just grilling in the parking lot because at least we're at a parking lot with lights changing yeah. the cam. So and then at two. So think about this: changing a camshaft I was on the say. side of the road, <laughs> and that's what you're appreciative of. That there was street lights, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. and pavement and asphalt. And pavement. So it's then, nice that we weren't in the woods. Oh. Yeah. And then, uh, so we started at 8 p.m., finished at 8 a.m. the next morning, and yeah. we were still 150 miles from the track. But at like three in the morning, Jeff Lutz and Scott roll in with the pro mod, and he rolls into the parking lot, and they get out of this thing, and they're just filthy because yeah. they've just been working on that thing the whole time. And then they they lay down and sleep on the side of the road, like next to us. And we're working on the car for like three hours. Well, first of all, they're uh, they, they've got gas fuel in. Uh, you know, they <laughs> they were just high on all the fumes. Oh my! Mm -hmm. So they get out. Of, Jeff gets out of the car. He goes, "What are you guys doing?" I go, "We're putting a camshaft." That's badass. And then he just falls oh, down falls and goes to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> he was done. The other thing is, I have this rule of I don't I don't want want to ever say I'm ready for a drag and drive. Like yeah. when people are like, oh, "Are you ready?" I'm like, "I don't." No, because if you say that, you're just gonna you're gonna yeah. play yourself, and yeah. you're gonna be at the second track, and your car's gonna be blown up or something's yeah. like wrong. You just have to you go into it not ready, and you just hope you get yeah. through it type exactly. of thing. And also, like if you get to a hotel, you like oh I got all this time. Then you wake up the next morning to get to the track. That's when the failure is gonna happen overnight when the car's not touched. Is when like the failure is yeah. gonna happen. When you think you got time, and like you kind of think there's like a calm to it. Oh yeah. Is when the things are really gonna hit the fan. So you almost have to get to the track as soon as you can. Yes. And as early as possible because if I dilly dally, I yeah. know that's when I'm gonna be out of time. So that's like sick week when we did it. The what was that 22? The first sick first, week. First one, yeah. Um, the last route was from South Georgia all the way back to Bradenton, but and that's when they stopped at Garlitz. And most guys stayed in Ocala, and then they drove to Bradenton the next morning because then we raced in the evening. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking, we're like, well, why don't we just go all the way down to Bradenton so if we have an issue, we're you already time. there yeah. and you have time to fix yeah. the car versus, you know, you stop in Ocala, you go to bed, you wake up to drive, and you're like, oh, something's messed up. you got to work on it. And that's what we did. My buddy Scott and Scott was uh, co-piling it with me, and so we, we got a run in at South Georgia, and we left at 3, three in the afternoon. Got to uh, Garlitz, did the checkpoint, and then we just carried on. We got to uh, the, the hotel at midnight in Bradenton. So 3 to midnight. We went the whole route. And then we— That was a tough route, too. That was really yeah, dark. Yeah, like dark and pitch long. black. Yep. Oh, and yeah. I don't know what it is, but all these cars have bad headlights. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just yeah. like a, a guarantee. Even yeah. if you have an OEM headlight, they're not good. They're not yep. good, exactly. So we ended up getting to the hotel. We parked underneath the entranceway. And uh, I went inside and I asked the girl, I said, hey, we've got to do a little work on the car. I said, oh, yeah, no problem. Well, we pull, I said, we got to pull the intake off and check the lifters. I said, I, I have you an tell idea. tell the check-in lady. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, okay. Okay. So, well, she comes out and she goes, oh, my God. I go, we will clean everything up. We won't leave anything. Like, there was parts everywhere. But uh, we ended up pulling the intake and, uh, and uh, checking the lifter. Sure enough, I had one just starting to get rough. So I said, okay, that was perfect. I said, I wanted to try to lay down a good pass at Bradenton, the last track. And uh, we, put it, we, got, we were done by 5 a.m. And then we took about two hours of sleep and then went to the track. So it was just like those dragon drives will wear you down. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, it it's, gets dangerous, too. You start to worry. Like, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm pretty wore out. I'm pretty run down right now. But. We're all yep. so stubborn. That yeah. like... Here's here's a good second part of that story of after we finished the cam. 
So uh, Jeff Lutz and Scott, they they oh, left yeah. before we were done. We get our car all patched up. We're on the road. It's it's like nine in the morning, and Scott calls me. He's like, "Hey, where are you guys at?" And we're like, "Oh, we're still like eighty miles from the track." He's like, "I just saw you drive by us. The wheel flew off the Pro Mod." Yeah, and we're mm-hmm. like, "What do you mean the wheel flew off the Pro Mod?" They're driving down the road, and the front wheel goes flying off into the ditch, and they're they're just, on the strut, and they're on the strut. And he's got carbon brakes. He's got oh. all this crazy stuff so, on the car. So we're like, it's hard on stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so we're like, how are you gonna find? How are you gonna find a, a carbon brake? You know, uh, spindle mount setup, and was it um, who was the uh, was it Goldstone that knew a buddy up there, that Brian so, Goldstone? Yeah. yeah, he had a buddy there that had parts, and they they folded it, it all on, and, and they, they just drove yeah, that, that it. stuff is relatively universal except for the the brakes and things. But yeah, yeah. Can you that, imagine being in a pro mod driving down the street going eighty miles an hour, and the front wheel just flies off? Yeah, I mean the spindle mount stuff scary to drive that much on the street. I've well, always wondered about that. Well, they have two versions now. They have an Anglia, which is the small bearings. They don't recommend it on a heavy car. Mm-hmm. And they what they've done on the new strange stuff is they've put a larger spindle, like a Camaro. It's basically like yeah. a Chevy Camaro. So it handles a larger bearing. So. I think um, I was hearing one story. What's the black Mustang with the big blower? Roy something or Vince? I can't think oh, of it. Oh, the uh, 65 or 66. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. The yeah. Car. Yep, yep. And like they like broke like converter to rear end one time. Oh. And I was like, oh, that's like that's that's like a an end of your week. Done. And like we found somebody with all of the same stuff. I was like, how does that even work? <laughs> that's <laughs> insane. Just like the, the luck of like yep. finding somebody local with yep. things. That's why Florida's nice because there's a lot of racers right. in this area but then you're somewhere like in the rocky mountains and you're like well there's not that much I, yeah here. well the one year you you were fixing everybody's transmission out yeah of drag week well I, I i basically gave myself an education on transmissions because i i was having them built professionally mm. and they they'd fail and it was always my fault so i was like i'm spending all this money i i, I can't believe it's that difficult so I started stripping them down, looking at them, trying to identify all the problems, and I just kind of, you get really good at doing stuff once you've done it so many yeah. times. And, and turbo four hundreds aren't crazy. Yeah, I mean they're complicated, but like once you know. I, I started with power glides, and they were they are yeah, super so simple. simple. Yeah, and uh, then we switched over to a four hundred. But yeah, um, so that year there was guys with multiple transmission issues, so we. Just kind of helped out building them in the parking lot, yeah, changing out shafts and, and drums, and just do you think it create... becomes just a cruising temperature issue a lot of the time? No, it's it just... inf- inferior parts. Like a lot of the like you when you strip a transmission down that's supposedly going to handle X amount of horsepower, you open it up and it's got a stock shaft here, it's got a stock drum. They're not designed to handle that kind of abuse, especially mm-hmm. in a heavyweight car. So it's just it all comes down to part failure because there's just not they're not adequate parts. Well, what was the most common failure in those? transmissions you think other than the sprag like in the 400 uh, if you use a stock input shaft they'll, they'll handle about a thousand horsepower and, and then you need after to go that, to a big shaft or at uh, least a just a, even a good 300 m will work but yeah ultimately now they've got larger shafts so i was watching this weekend at snowbirds mark mickey was just churning those things out oh, yeah. people were coming at him with more broken parts yeah. than i'd ever seen yeah oh, and God. he was quick they i mean they're prepared to fully rebuild those things like yeah, right. 10 cases of lap fluid ready to sell oh, and yeah like, gosh yeah we uh like i said we we've, we've maintained all of our own transmissions and then i got to a point where we were going to try to change gear ratios and with a 400 you you're you're limited in the case so i had to would have to buy an aftermarket case and all mm-hmm. that so so i actually use cone products yeah uh and um i priced out all the parts versus having them build one and I had them build one just because it was, it was cheaper to have them build yeah it. it was actually a little less money so he gave us a little break on it so we got a really good we got a pro mod style transmission and it's got um, it's got a larger main shaft and it's got the inch 250 input shaft so it's so like it's, a Bruno Lenko input yeah, shaft it's like mm-hmm. it'll handle it's handles four thousand like the 4,000 horsepower deal yeah. so and you know they're like you don't need all that I said I understand that but we're it's in a 3,500 pound car it's not in a 2,000 pound pro mod so yeah it's nice to be a little over overkill exactly and then. if you can you don't you look can swing a couple nicer parts you yeah. might as well because once you break something and it tears up something else exactly. then all of a sudden you're like well exactly you know, just sprung for the better stuff but yeah. we've uh the the, tra- the transmission before uh stock case stock gear set uh, turbo 400 handled it'll they'll handle 2500 horsepower it's it's incredible what they'll handle yeah you just cut the bell housing off and put a nice bell yeah, on it yeah you put that's a, what i'll eventually do to my car probably stock gear set nothing crazy yep yeah, yep yeah. because it'd be nice to do a close ratio but you know how that gets 
they get pricey for You're, sure. Are you a 180 right now in, in the glide? Yeah. Yeah, well, stocks uh, stock is two forty eight, so you'd have to do a, either a second, second gear, lead. gear one forty eight, yeah, mm-hmm. one forty eight, which would be a little taller, which would probably help your wheelie. But it, I don't know if you need that. That it might grunt. be hard for the two J to push that starting line ratio. Unless you really up know. the gear, unless you, he ups the rear gear. Yeah, so yeah, change, change it off rear gear. I just went from a three fifty to a three seventy. And that, so, that helped a lot on getting the car to short track a little bit harder. Yeah, and you can still out get back. out the back with the 370. Yeah. So the car might work really well with the 370. I'm only like 8,000 RPM coming through the traps, and I, oh, I okay. could go to like 9,600. Yeah, so you can you can afford, if you go a little bit taller on your, your first gear, your wheelie problem will probably go away. Mm-hmm. So why did you go with an, uh, an RX-7? Because you don't strike me as a JDM <laughs> guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I always liked the look of odd vehicles. I actually was going to do an AMC at one point, mm. and he was, they were like, like no. a javelin. No, it wasn't a javelin. It was the uh, it was an ugly it was an uglier looking car. <laughs> like it was just ugly. <laughs> Great description. <laughs> of it. You're really selling yeah. us. Yeah, <laughs> I just wanted I liked there being a little bit different. Yeah. But then I started thinking about okay, uh, maybe aerodynamics could play a part in drag racing, which it more, more than likely does. So I was looking at the uh, I was looking at the Porsches, then a nine forty four. And then I saw the RX-7. I said, that's a good-looking car. And at the time, like, even an FD was cheap. Now, forget about it. And all the import guys run the, the FCs with the three and four rotors, and they fly. Yeah. So we're like, okay, we know this, the car will probably car will work. work. Yeah. I'm not a purist on any car besides RX-7s, really, <laughs> unless you're like you guys. But I, I dislike when, like, the streetcar guys, like, just no cage, like, yeah. still IRS do an LS because I'm like, ah. Yeah. yeah, that's the one car that should stick with what it's got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for that purpose, for sure. It was well, more just a, a vessel. Yeah, I, I got it as a roller. I, I think I paid eight eight hundred dollars for the body. Come out of Kissimmee, and um, it was used as a drift because the all the rocker panels were crushed. Uh, it just it, it was banged up. Every panel had a dent in it, so it had a different door on it. And so I bought the car and basically started cutting it up and. Um, I bought some extra pieces and kind of assembled it. So we we did it start to finish. I built all the chassis in it. Uh, di- I did all the body work up to the paint stage. Then my one of one of my buddies did all the uh, final sanding and painting on the car. Mm-hmm. But I still I, I was able to purchase all the factory weather stripping and trim pieces for it from uh, Mazda. They were pricey as hell, but it made it made the car look real tight. When and it it's completely on. watertight, smoke tight. Yeah, like, doors cl- close closely nice. oh, yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. feel like a rattle yeah. box when yeah. it closes. Yeah. Like a, there's a bunch of change in it. Exactly. And that's partially why it's so heavy. Yeah, <laughs> it's, I left it's got everything, everything there. The moonroof still works. The, yeah. the flip side of that coin, I guess. Is, yeah, <laughs> is it yeah. is heavy. Yeah. yeah, I think. I mean, the car is a great drag and drive car because it has all of those amenities. That's nice to have for street driving. Like if you you're driving in the car with the windows. I mean, we don't like to roll the windows up because then you hear all the all the noise from the noise engine. In the yeah. engine. <laughs> you start so, to panic a little. Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're like, like, oh, you get anxiety. What was that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, that that's what the car is. It's we didn't intend for it to go as fast as it's going, and that yeah. I feel like so many guys run into the same things with their builds. Yeah. Yeah. Thankfully, I mean, you guys have enough cage, though. Yeah. A lot of us is like, oh, we didn't intend for it to go this fast. That's why it's only got a bolt-in roll right. bar. Right. It's like, well, yeah. You're yeah. going six nineties, so maybe. <laughs> yeah, I, I went right to the twenty-five-three spec. I, I I bought the book and I just kind of I actually overkilled some of the bars in the roof. Mm-hmm. I, I I you can really pay attention to the rules uh, set on the on what you need and for bars and. I just stepped them all up just for safety's sake. Is it chromoly? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know if it was mild steel. In the yeah, that's all the 25 3 chromoly chassis. Yeah. Now everybody's using that. Um, Dokal. Dokal. Dokal R8. Yeah. yeah. That's what the. My new build is. Uh, Dokal. Yeah. It seems pretty nice. I... Yeah. There's no. There's no weight difference. I think it's. Uh, it's um, how the. If you. If you get it hot, it's not brittle like chromoly mm. or chromoly can. I guess snap at a weld or crack yeah. at a weld. It's, it's a little more malleable. If somebody does the cage wrong on a molly build, it'll end up, it'll fracture yes. when you see it crash yep. or something. Right. And you won't know until it's the bad time, I guess, exactly. to know. Yep. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I have such a love-hate with no time because, like, I, I like running the class, but it is kind of a bummer to watch it and not know exactly what's going on. And, like, yeah, I go back and forth on that. And I understand, like, there's a lot of, like, my viewers that dislike it because... You don't really know what's going on, sure. so it's hard to know. I think what it comes down to is 
obviously like this weekend was I I think that this weekend at the Snowbirds was probably the fastest snow time field that I've seen in Florida. Mm-hmm. I don't I can't speak to like any of the Carolina races um cuz we haven't been to any of those, but um the thing with class racing is you have to be prepared to blow your stuff up. And yep. that's kind of what we don't really like. And we like for our combination we would probably do a big block twin turbo combo. And we and it would have to be LDR. Yeah, Thirty two hundred pounds. We're not. We can't compete with. You know, we can't compete with the other cars unless we build something like an engine that's similar, to like Justin Martin's full billet yeah. engine. Like we're not. You can't compete. I don't, with have, the, I don't have the. Not that I don't have the budget. I just. I. I can't see doing that. It's that's not us. We don't. We, we're not. It drains some of the fun out. Yeah, for sure. and and we'd like to stick to like local races, support Troy's races, and the other races at Bradenton, Orlando, where you don't have to go as fast as. Um, you you can be competitive going a little bit slower. We're kind of like. With the new builds, since there's no weight limit, no time, we're just build it as light as possible yeah. and get it to run a number that we know it should run, and then you can dial it back a little bit, and it'll just run run on rails. Yeah, they. I was talking to one no time guy, and he said he put 25 different staters in his car in a week. Oh my god, yeah, I, be, I believe it. <laughs> trying to figure it out, and I was like, oh, I believe it. That's, that's more work than I'm willing to do like, right there. Like the really really fast no time classes, it's pretty much like class racing, but it's. It's a little bit more wild because you don't know exactly what the guy runs. I, yeah, you don't know what you're trying for. Yeah, so like you, you don't know if you're trying for a 390 or a 410. Right. And, and if you've watched racing long enough, I would say we probably have a good idea of knowing what cars run within a tenth, tenth and a half, just because you've seen so yeah. many cars go down the track. Yeah, and, and we pay attention to their procedure, like how they take the st- how they take the track, how they stage, how they how fast they can spool up. So that gives us an idea. Okay, if we draw these guys, this is what we need to do mm-hmm. to, to counteract that. So just pay attention to the small details, and it, it kind of helps I out. can tell you how fast they've been if you send me a video. I can <laughs> I can edit it to where yeah. I can see the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't like that very much. But yeah, if you're yeah. running it out, it's pretty easy to tell when the wind light comes on. When the, st- the tree drops, you can kind of tell. Now, I think I, I could be wrong, but... I think that the Bradenton wind light comes on late. It might. Because... You have to look at the cones. Yes, because when we raced, um, Troy's race, was it Battle in the Bay? Like, it was the COVID year, so he did it in May when it was usually in March. And we won the the Anything on 28 shootout. So in the final, I was like, <laughs> hey, don't don't let out till you see the wind light. And so we got the wind light. It doesn't come on. And I looked at the day log. I was like, you're on the... You're on the 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 gas for five point two seconds. <laughs> I said, like, I, I didn't see the wind light yeah. yet. So we're like, okay, maybe the wind Slow light comes on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the car ran four thirty or four forty or something. Well like a lot of these people don't realize too is like these track timing systems are all like eighties and nineties technology. Yeah. They're yeah. all like very old school mm. stuff. Like if you look at the track computer they're using, it's like, oh man, like, oh, yeah. there's not a whole lot going on here. Like yeah. this is if this thing goes down, like you might not even get parts for it. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, well, at least the I think most of the systems have fiber. At least like for the communication lines, mm-hmm. they have fiber. But yeah, yeah, they, Victor they, redid a lot of that stuff on theirs because yeah. they got hit with lightning. Right, and burnt oh, out yeah, almost the that. whole thing. Yeah, and I've I've seen a couple tracks do that. I actually like the new NHRA light style where well, they the got LED, the blue, the LED, yeah, see, and I'm the st- white. That kind of screws me up a little bit. I still like the old analog, <laughs> those big yellow balls. I know. It's Plus, kinda, I'm getting older, too. So <laughs> It's kind of nice, though, the little LED. You get, like, yeah. half, and then it does yeah, the other, yeah. and if you go through, it loses the white in the yeah. center. It's, yeah. it's a little weird, but it's kind of nice looking. Yeah. I don't it, know. It, that's a cool-looking tree. Yeah, or that's, that's definitely cool. I was sad to see Atlanta go. I mean, that was, like, for us, that was, like, our other closest mm. track. Yeah, I've never, I've never, that was, is that Commerce? Is that? Yeah. Yeah, I've never, I've never been to that track. Really? We haven't been up huh. there ever. Yeah. No. That seems like it would be like, because you guys are what, by Gainesville, right? No, no, we're yeah. actually East Coast. We're uh, Melbourne, Melbourne okay. area. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. So you're closest to Orlando then? Yeah, Orlando. Is, an hour. Yeah. That and then here is second closest. Well, it's about the same as Gainesville. Gainesville yeah. And then SGMP is like four hours. Yeah, SGMP is cool. I'm glad to, I, it'd be, I'm curious to see what new ownership brings for that new management. Yeah. Yeah. What Raul does with the place and what kind of racing he can bring and if he can work with like our style cars a little bit more would be nice. Even Orlando does a not the best job at like kind of getting in like our style cars because yep. I mean I ran World Series of World Street World Nationals Street last Nationals, year. Yep. yep. In Heavy Street and they took it out this year and yep. I haven't been back to Orlando 
Yeah, and for any reason, and that's what we said like with Orlando because we did World Street Nationals in the no time class. The slowest cars there are, are the ultra street cars, really. Um, pretty much, you have to be. It's it's more of a professional type race, and then you have your the index guys, or in, I think they have top sportsmen there too. Mm-hmm. But yep. yeah, it, they're mostly because I think that they they're doing the um, like ducks um, point series, it, the point series yeah. for the radial yep. stuff. So I think that that's more what that event has turned into. And they had they had a great pro mod race there too. They yep. were a lot most of the guys that were here were were at that race lot yep. two weekends ago. And they just had an import race this same weekend. Yes, yes. a big import race yep. where mm-hmm. they're like. Import pro mods, I guess. I don't know what the difference really is, but yeah. they look like pro mods. They sit like pro mods, but I guess they don't fit like NHRA outlaw. And they're, and then I think they run quarter mile with them. Right? Yeah, and they're all quarter mile oh, stuff. That's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, so oh, you know, the import events there. We've never been to one, but I've watched so excuse me so many feeds of those races, and it's, it's off the chain. It's it's Orlando looks like FL two K for the import mm-hmm. races, pretty much. Yeah, I've so seen some packed-looking stands, which is great. I mean, it's oh, great yeah. for racing. I just I don't understand it very much because I've never really been a part of that. Um, father-son stuff, because that's very interesting to me because I got yeah. my little son on the way soon enough. And I've talked to a couple people about this. How do you get your son to want to care about cars without forcing them? But also, did it just come naturally to you? Did you just want to be a part of the team? Because, I mean, you guys were racing since you were... I just, uh, my wife and I, we always, whatever we did, we would involve our children. And like, I have two daughters as well. And, you know, we, it's my passion to do some racing. So I would try to keep them comfortable and maybe rent an RV or, you know, have something yeah. for them to stay at the track with. And if you can get them to the track and, and keep them as a unit, they just kind of got used to it. And, you know, my, even my daughter, she goes, I, I like, I love coming to the track and watching. Like it's, they're competitive. So, you know, we, yeah. we try to be as competitive as we can. And he just kind of followed my lead and well you know p- uh, pick things up and uh then now now he's basically uh doing all the tuning on the car you know we we collaborate we still argue you know i have an old school method of thinking mm-hmm. i'm more on the mechanical side of things and uh, you know i just try to break things down if we have a problem say hey maybe it's not an electrical issue or maybe it's not in the tune-up maybe it's something on the car side so we work pretty good together as a team, and he's he's very passionate about it. And and I've told him, I said it's it's a it's a he he tunes on some uh, no t- uh, no prep cars as well, so it, it'd be a really cool side hustle if you know how to yeah, uh, work yeah. that computer. There's so. a lot of people looking for somebody that kind of understands what's going yeah. on a little bit and can help yeah. with like absolutely no time program. I definitely okay. like I always say, oh, like I'm 56 years old. I said a lot of guys my age or older are petrified of a laptop. Like they just are are scared of electronics and. I said that's like I did it in started in 07 and I'm glad I kind of embraced that because it's you're so far ahead of the game if you if you can make that stuff work. Yeah, if you avoid a laptop now on a drag strip, I mean you're yeah. not going to yeah, you're yeah. not going to make it very far. Exactly. Even the carburetor guys all still use yeah. laptops. Yeah. yeah. But I know I just remember like even when I was what was the first year that I went to World Street Nationals? It was probably like 2 oh years my God. old. Yeah, I, I used to take me to all the all the races, all the races yeah. when I was, you know, you still, I was still pulling, pulling them around in a little carriage and stuff. Yeah. You know, it just, I, my parents were actually in a racing business in the late 60s, early 70s. Okay. Uh, they owned uh, circle track, uh, stock car tracks. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I was kind of born into that stuff. And uh, I, was, I was one of those little track guys that it, we'd be, I'd be as a little kid running around everywhere and just looking at all the cars and stuff. And, and everyone it, knew you type of deal. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. And my, my dad owned the track or my dad and my grandfather owned the track. So it was kind of cool. And uh, just kind of stuck with it. And uh, through my teen years, I always had, uh, I bought my first car, put the big block in it. I always had some sort of little performance car. Uh, did a little drag racing way back when. And then when I got married, I kind of let it go. And then when I had the kids and they were just a little old enough to start coming out, I got back into it. So I'll try Yeah, to- I've talked to a couple people like that where like Joe at Fast Forward was kind of saying the same thing. Like once his kid was born, he stopped for a little bit. And yep. then once his kid was old enough to like be kind of around it, yep. he he wants to get back into it. Sure. So it's kind of the I guess that's a natural progression. People always make the joke of like, oh the kid's here, now you gotta sell the cars. No. But you can kind of was- incorporate them in. And you're an engineer. Right, that's what you went to school for. So, yep. kind of the peak engineering almost is getting a car down the track and working right. It is like I I just remember being probably 
10, 11 years old. And I always liked the fact that, okay, you make a change on something and you go, you, you, you make a pass it. and yeah. then you make another change and you're always just trying to yeah. slowly progress and make something better. And it's like, okay, if this failed, all right, let's fix that. So it doesn't fail. It's more about just the, the gratification of doing something yourself and making changes with just the knowledge between, you know, your group yeah. and being able to see that. In it kind of makes car. you flex like every muscle too of an engineer of like yeah. the hydrodynamics, like what the fluids are doing and all that, like transmission and stuff. And then like what all kinds of different pressures and like there's there's every level depending on what you want. Like you could just be aerodynamics and worry about that oh, stuff. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. yeah. even like the, if you want to go out to the salt flats and just worry about your aerodynamics really. Yeah. And at the end of the day, with all of this stuff, um, if they're, you have to pay attention to all the guys that are fast. Yeah. Because you'll learn so much just paying attention. Or like, why are they doing this? Maybe mm -hmm. we can incorporate, you know, some of the stuff that they're doing. I know a lot of these programs are just, you know, crazy budgets, and they, it's unlimited. They do whatever they want. But as far as picking up little things from people, you have to listen to everybody. I think when you're trying to learn things and then filter out what you think works and what doesn't yeah. yeah well also because you'll get advice like what somebody's doing on their car but it may not fully translate to your right. car like it may be completely backwards from yeah. what you need to do yeah and i've heard that advice before and i'm like well it's great advice but it's not going to work at all mm -hmm. in my combination right okay like, I'm sorry, my G meter falls off at 1.2 <laughs> seconds. I can't control that. Like, right. I don't have enough horsepower, but like things like that, you know, like you have to pick and choose yep. who you listen to. And then watching a program of like two people run successfully right. is really cool and really awesome to see. And it doesn't happen all that often where like a two person team is like crushing it and winning. So it's, I, I try to surround myself with that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. For sure. Can't be around these teams that are, you know, $10 million budget a year yeah. and expect to and gain there's, much. There's motors hanging on the ground and like they've got extra engines in the trailer and it's like, holy mackerel, like how do you, how can you compete with stuff like that? It's just. Yeah, you just have to listen to the data and that's yep. why I like to hang out with Brett and Jim and those guys because they're very like dialed in on like every small portion of the car sure. instead of just like more horsepower, more power, more yeah. power. Like it's that little incremental stuff that kind of yep. just that kind of just does it takes yeah, you to the you next level to. you you fix all the little small things and it adds up to something bigger so where do you think we're going with streetcar rules what even is i don't even know what a streetcar is i've never really been able to answer that question well like you said it's a, it's a race car that you can drive on the street yeah <laughs> right that's that, to me that's the rule that's the skill set or the rule set i know i think you have to break it down to two to three different cl classifications because you have your if you want to say, okay, a streetcar is a daily driver, okay, then what is a daily driver? Something that has air conditioning, it's comfortable, you can take it on a road trip, but then you get into um, a drag and drive car where it's like most of the, like Pur all the competitive drag and drive cars, built. they're purpose built. Mm -hmm. yep. They're like, okay, we're, I'm not necessarily going to be daily driving this car, but I can take it on a road trip and nothing's going to fail. Like I can go, a thousand miles in a week and nothing's going to fail on it. But then there's the aspect of there's a ton of maintenance with those things. I don't yes. know of anybody that runs faster than even 80 that isn't doing crazy maintenance on their cars after they complete a drag and drive. Yeah, you, yeah. So yeah. and like Bailey's car is a drag and drive car, but it is not a street car by our no. rules definition. Didn't start off as a and a, a, a regular car. It's a car. street car because it could drive on the street, but it is it does not fit the definition of a. FL2K, TX2K style. Yeah. I think one thing that everybody can, or most everybody can probably agree on is it has to be a factory produced body. Yeah. Um, Ideally, floors are still there yeah. from the factory. Yeah, you I don't, think. I think that having, you know, double frame rail transmission exposed stuff, that's more, you're kind of getting away from that. Like most street cars are going to have everything covered with carpet and mm -hmm. There's some. There's also some aspect of interior pieces. I would think, like on um, like the RX-7's got all factory interior in it, except for well, it doesn't have whatever rear seat was there before. See, on the flip side, I'm like, as long as it fits a weight, I because yeah. like you guys have all your interior and you're what thirty five hundred pounds. You could probably get it down to like thirty four and still thirty three ish. Yeah, but like. You know, if a Mustang is missing all of its interior, like these new S197s, but it's still 
3,800 pounds, but right. it's got no interior, then I'm like, well, I get it. Like, whatever. Like, it kind of kind of works. But then you see a fox body that's gutted out, and you're like, yeah. well, it's 2,500 pounds. Yeah. Maybe he should have his full interior, but then they even put him back in, and it's like 50 pounds for door cards and dash. And it's right. Like, oh. So I didn't pay huge attention to, like, the streetcar class this year at FL2K, but from what, you know, the, the little bit that we saw, you had – um, Jim, and then the guy in the... Travis, man, Travis. in the red S2000. So you had a couple guys running faster than 730, right? And then yep. there was a little bit of a gap, and then you had like 750, 60, 70 cars. Yep. So there's still... I know they took out like us and Garrett, and then Brett could run and it, Duke, but he Will, didn't. And uh, Dugas, right? With and the Viper. and yeah. Will Dugas with the Viper. So they took us out, but I think that it got reset to a new... Um, kind of group of guys that are going to be running the show. Well, and Brett just chose not to run it. Exactly. Like, so, he fit. So that's my point. So if you had us four in there, you would have your couple guys run 730, 20s, high teens, and then you would have us going, you know, 60s to 40s or 60s mm -hmm. to 30s. So, but now what I'm saying is you've got three or four guys that are kind of that new standard of they're a couple tenths ahead of yeah. the other guys. So yeah. you either have to slow them down or make everybody speed up to that. Yeah. And, like, there's a couple things I think streetcars should also have. Like, I think they should be intercooled somehow. It could be air to water, air to air. I think they should have intercoolers because it kind of weeds out some of just, like, the pure methanol or, like, you know, I think adding an intercooler adds, like, this natural restriction as well, which is kind of nice. I, I like seeing carpet in a car, but, you know, my car's got speaker box carpet, so it weighs, yeah. like, nothing, but it's, it's something. And then there's just, like, that fact. I, I like that my hood opens with struts. Yeah, right. I, just like ours, yeah. It it's just makes hood. sense. Like, yep. you don't need more there's than no one person. There's no lift off. There's no deuce fasteners. No, nothing. Yeah, nothing. It just opens right up, and it's same with my hatch. Same deal. I love the power windows. I, and then, and Mine are crank. Yeah. <laughs> but close, close enough, enough, yeah. That's close enough. And I think the crank is heavier on the F-bodies than, yeah. the, than the power. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that one, yeah, like I said before with the real bodies, I think that pretty much everything that... Um, like all the functions of the vehicle as it came factory, like you said, with the hood, the doors, the windows, like all that stuff should work. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't really think that, um, you know, composite components like fenders, hood, bumper, deck lid, I don't think street cars should have that stuff. I, I think don't. it should mostly be all steel, all glass cars. But if you add a weight, like if you add like a weight like 3,000 pounds, then it almost doesn't matter. I don't care. Like even in, like, so I race B class. Mm -hmm. I don't care what you have. I have, right. it's an index. You could have a pro mod. It doesn't really affect yeah. me because you still have to go the same speed as right. me. So it really only matters in A class. Yeah, right. Because like all my friends in B class that were like, oh, but he's got carbon this. In fact, I'm like, doesn't matter. like why? What's the difference, right? Yeah, like he still has to go 820 or Breaks whatever. Out, like done. in the C class, yeah. like it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like. I don't know. Then then it just becomes stupid because that's why, like, the index cars can run big tires. Like, it doesn't matter. It's just. Right. So I can't really complain because I'm just an index racer. <laughs> yeah, with the, with the street car stuff, I don't know. I don't know where it's going to go. Because the index isn't fun. I don't enjoy being an index racer. I'd rather run my car all out, but I'm not going to run into a class that runs 720s. Yeah. That doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. And then even then, like, it's really hard on a 2J to string them out like that. Very few 2Js end up being able to go four rounds at 720. They're, they're going to hiccup somewhere, mm. some kind of issue. And it's just the nature of it. It's yeah, just, right. You start to string it out that far at that weight, and it's just you're going to have issues. But mm. I don't know. We'll see what changes over the next. Yeah, it'll be interesting to follow for sure. And um, I, I still think it would be really cool to have some sort of Elite 8 or mm -hmm. – but – Again, you we can probably we can sit here and count. We know four or five guys that would probably be a really competitive race, but you got to find four more. Yeah. yeah. So well, the no prep world's in the same deal. I mean, they're they're in this struggle of like pro mods now on the street. Yeah. And they're kind of like, well, what do you do? Do you just lower payout? Right. And that's it's an interesting tactic. It sucks to hear, but it does make sense. Because right. if you lower payout from ten grand, which sounds cool on paper, to like four grand for streetcar, right, right, then you push more people into the twenty eights. Mm -hmm. So what I thought that some of the um, no prep stuff, like at least the the world that I've been in a little bit, um, they've done a. They usually do most of the races like in Douglas, Georgia. I don't know if you have ever been to that track. 
No. But it's it's an old, like, guardrail. It's mm. concrete for the first 60 feet, and it's all <laughs> asphalt. But uh, that tr- some grass in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That that track is it, – it's a really cool track. It's, it's, it's the trees dark, are what right? keep you and in. It's, <laughs> yes. But uh, it's out in the middle of nowhere in, in Georgia. But they have – I think they have really good classes for like if you want. They have a like a street style. They have two different street classes. So they have your your twenty eights, which is pretty much anything on a twenty eight, and then they have what's called Mod Street, which the cars that I tune on there in Mod Street. So you have to have um, it's all steel, all glass except for the hood. It has to have factory door panels, factory dash. It's got to have a cooling system, radiator, uh, water pump, alternator. Um, but then they limit it to uh, nitrous. It's like uh, X275 rule, so mm-hmm. uh, turbo small block. Or you can have like twin T4s. So they limit it in that aspect with the engine combinations. And then they have more of a daily type class, which is um, – it's not really an index because it's no time, but it's mostly cars running like 6.0 or slower. So that's kind of – But do kinda, you end up with just a bunch of Fox bodies in that other class? It's mostly Fox bodies that's and F bodies. And um, there's actually – you know what? There's There's – like a lot of trucks. A couple and, 240s, I'm sure, fit yeah. into that because 240s can get pretty light with all steel, all glass still. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. There's yeah, there's a couple different Mustangs, um, yeah, F bodies, trucks. There's some wagons. There's some older cars, but it's it's not like full of Fox bodies. Mm-hmm. But that would that is probably the most dominant car the for that class. The unfortunate yeah. part of it, uh, you just can't get away yeah, from it. Yeah, it and, and it's stock suspension, so it's like those things on no prep too just work. Yeah, there's an easy formula. Yeah, mm-hmm. very simple like. You know, you do this with the bars and you're good. Like yeah. it's not anything crazy. Even the mm-hmm. struts that they make for them, like yeah, they the all front have the... are just insane. Like a what is they like a dirt style where the oh, struts yeah. just they, we just throw those things up there and just let it ride. That's tough. It's tough to. I, I wouldn't like to be a rule maker. <laughs> That's for sure. Like yeah. somebody like John Sears or somebody that does those no prep rule stuff. And yeah, it's tough to make any rules for no time because. Those guys won't even go near a scales booth or anything. Oh yeah, yeah like, no way, no way. Some of those cars, like if if you have the scales on, they're not coming mm-hmm. near you. <laughs> yeah, I think the yeah no time like at least um, like Florida no time rules is pretty much just you can't stretch it plus or minus two inches and you you it can't be a pro mod body. But like David Reese's car that that Nova that thing is wicked. It's a full carbon mm-hmm. Nova, so it's like okay, well that it fits the rules. And it's a pretty much a, we'll run whatever you want on a twenty eight. So, but our time is also our our no time is also very different from a lot because we're like tight track no time versus like a lot of the country does like no prep no time. Oh, you're, okay, yeah. yeah. You know so what I mean? So like we kind of have that different almost split here. We don't really have any no prep in Florida. It's kind of no, like a, Orlando does some. Well, see, Orlando is not really no prep except for when they do it backside, backside which mm-hmm. they just did. But the front side no prep. You can go it, fast. On the, on it's like surface. no prep kings is still like tight track. Yeah. Yeah. Like Especially I, after a couple of rounds, it starts to really turn around. I've seen them spray. I've seen videos yeah. of them spray. Like if, you've, if you have a like a 490 car, you won't spin. Mm-hmm. Um, like I know like Troy, they dominated with that. Char- uh, um, what they, was that Corvette? That, that Dogfish, that blue yeah. Corvette, yeah. and then that the uh, Camaro that, that they, the guy the wrote. That orange Ron one. Ron Swanson. Yeah. Yep. So, and I know that they're... They're going pretty fast on that surface. Yeah, they, so they've always had some good stuff. Well, we'll end it off here, guys. This was really fun. Um, do you? Where can they follow you guys at? Where can they find you guys at? Your team? Your so your we pretty car. much just got Instagram, the Green Mamba. Um, that's pretty much it. We're not really anywhere on social media, YouTube, none of that. We're yeah. kind of low key. Pretty much just go out and race. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> try to have some fun. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you guys coming on. Thank this you for having a lot us, of fun, man. Alrighty, absolutely. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you. See you guys next time.